Agwe di tuno kena datia uno diri mukaro agwe bana woriken taino daka. So I wanted to say uh, greetings, uh, sisters and brothers. Uh, my name is Roberto Mucaro Borrero. I'm a member of the Taino Indigenous Nation. I just gave you a very quick briefing, brief introduction in uh, my indigenous language. And I'm very happy to be uh, the moderator of today's uh, event, Indigenous Peoples at the United Nations, Project Access Online. This is a side event of the high level political forum uh, on sustainable development, uh, the United Nations High Level Political Forum on Sustainable Development. And uh, we'll be uh, having a very exciting program today, I hope, I trust, uh, with all these great speakers and presentation. We're really excited about, uh, in particular today, the launching, the relaunching of our course, Indigenous Peoples uh, at the United Nations, because uh, now uh, the course is featured in several languages, uh, French, uh, Portuguese, and Spanish. Originally, um, we launched back in April, and uh, the course was available in English, but now we're happy to say that uh, the course is now available uh, in those languages, which we hope will increase um, the uh, participation uh, in this initiative and also just help uh, provide an introductory level um, to the United Nations uh, and advocacy and opportunities for indigenous peoples. Now before I, I continue on and uh, introduce uh, our next speaker and tell you a little bit about how the program is going to go today, I want to just let you know that uh, interpretation is available in French in Spanish and in Portuguese and all you need to do is uh, look at the bottom right of your screen you'll see uh, a globe it has there's a uh, underneath that it says interpretation you want to click on that and then click on your language uh, that that you want to hear whether it's um, English French Spanish or Portuguese and I'm wondering if uh, perhaps the interpreters, or maybe you, if we have that, uh, if we have the directions in each language, we could just post them in the chat. Uh, this way, uh, we can just go into. Thank you very much. I could see the Portuguese is in there already. Uh, for those who uh, speak Portuguese, there are your instructions for the interpretation, and we will have others uh, coming up. French is there now and we will have Spanish soon. So again, uh, this this side event is uh, in recognition of the launch of Indigenous Peoples at the United Nations Project Access Online, which is a collaboration uh, between the United Nations Development Program and the Learning for Nature Group uh, and the Tribal Link Foundation. Uh, the course itself is based on our live program, uh, Tribal Link's live program called Project Access. And we usually do this program uh, before the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, inviting uh, a number of Indigenous leaders uh, to participate in a three-day intensive. Uh, however, due to COVID-19 and the ongoing uh, reproduction, uh, repercussions of the pandemic, uh, we uh, were very fortunate to be able to collaborate with UNDP and the Learning for Nature team and the Equator Initiative and uh, put together uh, a version of this live course and convert it to an online uh, introductory session. And uh, what we're hoping that uh, you'll find this course useful and that it better explains your advocacy uh, opportunities at the United Nations level. And so uh, to talk a little bit more about the course, uh, so you could see how to, you can actually sign up if you have not done so already, if you have not joined the over 1,500 registrants who've already uh, been engaging in, uh, this uh, course, Indigenous Peoples at the United Nations, uh, we're going to be showing a video uh, to give you uh, an idea of how you can get uh, into that and register there. So. Uh, my dear colleague and friend here, Julie, will be sharing that video. Anything else you want to say before uh, the video, Julie? Thank you so much, Roberto. Um, let me 
share my screen and I would like to encourage you all before you register for the course to register on learningfornature.org. And after you register, you'll be able to enroll in the course and you can find it in our course offerings here. Here is the Indigenous Peoples of the United Nations Project Access Online Self-Paced Course. You can see we already have over 1500 registrants and this is where you can find the language versions. And in the course room, you can scroll down here. This is our event. And this is where you can start the course. And this is how you can find the video I'm about to show you now. I'm going to share again, just so I have my computer sound. Thank you for bearing with me. Welcome to the self-paced course, Indigenous Peoples of the United Nations Project Access Online. My name is Victoria and in the short video I'll walk you through our course room and show you how to complete the course activities. This is a self-paced course, which means that you can start the course activities and complete them at any time, going over the content at your own pace. When you enter the course room, you will find yourself on this page. There are several resources here that could be useful to you. If you need technical assistance, you can contact the course coordinator here. You can access the frequently asked questions here. And here you can find the course syllabus. The syllabus specifies the course requirements. You can also find this information on the course homepage. There are three required components of the course. We ask that you listen to all course lectures, pass for quizzes, and provide your feedback in the course survey. Once you complete these requirements, you will be able to download the course completion certificate directly from this course room. You will see a blue button that says download your certificate above the course content section here. Now let's walk through the material that you will encounter in each module. I'll click on module one to show you the typical activities. Again, you may start and complete each module at any time. There is no time limit for completing any of the activities. So the tabs for each module contain the video lectures, the discussion forum, and the quiz. Now, how do these components work together? The video lectures feature course experts who give you an overview of the module's topics. The workbooks accompanying the lectures allow you to take a deeper dive into each topic. They're available in PDF format, so they can easily be printed out and used for taking notes as you're reviewing the lectures. To test your comprehension of the content of the lectures in the workbooks, we ask you to take a short quiz. To pass the quiz, you must receive a score of 60% or higher. If you don't get all the questions right the first time around, don't worry, you can retake the quiz as many times as you need. After you've reviewed the lectures in the workbooks and checked your understanding of the content by taking the quiz, you can now bring all this information together and discuss it on the discussion forum with other participants. Modules two and three will follow the same format. The course will conclude with key takeaways and an opportunity to provide feedback about your learning experience through the required course survey. Now you might wonder, how do I know if I'm on track with all the course activities? At any point in the course, you will be able to easily track your progress. Once you complete an activity, you will see a green check mark next to that activity. Your course completion certificate will be automatically generated once all the activities in the course homepage are marked with green check marks. And that's it, simple, right? Each of the modules contains an instructional email. At any point during the course, if you're not sure about the course requirements, we invite you to refer to that instructional email. One last point before we wrap up this video. Throughout the course, we encourage you to be active on the discussion forum. Learning for Nature offers an opportunity to easily interact with each other, send messages to the Learning for Nature community members, and have a lively discussion. We hope you will take advantage of this interactive environment and engage in conversations with other participants. Get started right now by introducing yourself in the Meet and Greet section on the homepage. 
to receive email notifications when new comments are posted on any of the forums, you have an option to subscribe to forum activity here. Once again, we're excited to welcome you to the course and wish you a great learning experience. Thank you so much, Victoria, for recording that video. And uh, I encourage my colleagues to drop uh, the links to the course room in the chat for all languages, please. Thanks so much. Uh, back to you, Roberto. Thank you so much, Julie. I appreciate that. And thank you, Victoria, for, for uh, providing that intro to how uh, people can access uh, Indigenous Peoples at the United Nations Project Access Online. Well, right now, I mentioned in the beginning, uh, this was a collaboration between the Tribal Link Foundation and uh, the United Nations Development Program, uh, UNDP, uh, in particular, Equator Initiative and Learning for Nature. Uh, we had a great collaboration, and I think the results uh, speak for themselves in the excitement uh, that this course has generated. And uh, we look forward to seeing even more people uh, participate now that we have these uh, language versions available. Um, so with that in mind, I want to invite um, our colleague uh, Nina Kancheva to come and share a few words from the UNDP side. Uh, Nina, when you're ready, you have the floor. Great. Thank you so much, Roberto. Dobar uh, den. I'm saying hello in my Bulgarian language. Um, it's really great to be here. Thank you so much. And um, before we go into uh, hearing from the wonderful panelists, I wanted to give you a bit of a picture of where we are with the course. The course has now been open for about um, three months, and we wanted to give uh, an overview of what has what we've heard from participants and what has the feedback been on um, on the course. So. Before that, I just wanted to welcome you uh, on behalf of UNDP, on behalf of the Learning for Nature program, um, uh, and um, to say that I really thank you for being here. It, it's really an honor for us to partner with our friends at Tribaling Foundation on making it possible for Indigenous peoples and allies around the world to access this course. In the course, you will learn that Indigenous peoples weren't welcome at the United Nations for decades. They had started coming to the League of Nations in the 1920s, but didn't get access to the UN until 1977. You'll learn that in one of the, one of the first lectures of the, of the course, if you haven't taken it yet. So with this course and um, us enabling the, um, the platform and making it available online, we hope to contribute a little bit to writing this historical injustice, as well as to honor the commitment of our partners, Tribaling Foundation, and especially its founder, Pamela Kraft, a personal mentor to me and an inspiring and loyal ally to indigenous peoples who never wavered in her commitment to indigenous peoples and who found many, many creative ways to help I learned a lot about being an ally to Indigenous peoples from, from Pamela, who we miss very dearly. Through our long-standing relationship with Traveling Foundation and making the training available widely via the virtual space, we committed to taking the training which used to be done in person, a very wonderful um, training that not only built the capacity of indigenous peoples to affect the global policy arena, but also to create a family. And I know that Tai and Roberto and others will talk about this. We'll talk about the fact that uh, Project Access brought people together as a family, not just, um, not just to learn, but also to, to build a relationship. Okay, I'm going to shift a little bit into giving you a bit of a sense of where we are with the course so far. Since the launch of the course in early April of this year, the course has attracted over 1500 registrants. They came from a variety of fields uh, with the majority representing nonprofits, academia, the public sector, private sector, and the UN. One note is that some of the categories are not quite precise. So NGOs would also contain indigenous organizations. Um, and, and I know that's a note for us to, to be much more precise about the categories. 
Reviewing the survey responses from participants who already completed the course, we were able to get an idea not only of why they joined the course, but also how they plan to use what they learned. Now, whether you're considering enrolling in the course in English, French, Spanish, or Portuguese, or you're already a part of the course community, you might be interested to hear that the majority of participants joined the course because of general curiosity, a general wish and desire to learn more about indigenous peoples and how to affect the, the global level. The second largest group joined because their work required this knowledge. And finally, a large proportion also was seeking to connect with indigenous peoples. We were pleased to see the levels of interest in the course among indigenous peoples. Over 40% of course graduates so far reported that they self-identify as indigenous peoples. And in the three months that the course has been online, course graduates reported a significant increase in their understanding of the core issues covered in the course. I think we can go to the next slide. Thank you so much, Julie. Specifically, you can see really what an impact the course has made in people's understanding. We saw an over 50% increase in knowledge of the history of indigenous people's movement for recognition of the United Nations, a 40% increase in the knowledge of the entry point for indigenous people's engagement with various bodies and mechanisms at the UN, and a similar level of improvement in their understanding of opportunities for indigenous peoples engagement and advocacy at the United Nations. The information presented in the course had a variety of applications for the participants. Uh, for example, the graduates in the course noted that they plan to use this new knowledge and skills in their work with indigenous organizations or in developing strategies to, pr to protect environmental and sacred sites and fight against environmental discrimination. Other uses included helping indigenous people stay informed of their land rights, of their rights and other, including land rights, advocating for indigenous peoples, integrating the indigenous people's perspective and insight in a variety of projects and preparing their community to participate in the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. We look forward to learning how you will use the information in the course and we wish you a pleasant learning experience. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nina, uh, for presenting that and sharing that uh, excellent information. It's, it's really nice to see how people are engaging and really see the difference that it's made uh, so far. Uh, with so many people. You know, uh, I mentioned in the beginning of uh, of this program that this is a side event of the High Level Political Forum on uh, Sustainable Development. And uh, within the course, we mentioned uh, that uh, the course overall provides uh, not only the history, uh, not only uh, opportunities for you to uh, learn a little bit more about some technical aspects of engagement at the UN or, or at other uh, higher level uh, national, local and global meetings like such as uh, preparing, preparing an intervention or a testimony, uh, but it also um, focuses on, on uh, specific opportunity engagement opportunities for indigenous peoples at the United Nations. And one of the engagement opportunities uh, deals specifically with the uh, United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals and the High Level Political Forum uh, on Sustainable Development. So what I want to do is um, just kind of uh, for folks who may be new uh, to this subject, new to the HLPF, we're, we're really at the close of this year's HLPF session. However, what we hoped for uh, with this program is that we could uh, share this opportunity with, with you, that you would engage in the course and be better prepared for next year's HLPF and other opportunities that you might uh, want to engage uh, moving forward, uh, you or others. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen. Uh, I have a few slides here from a longer presentation. I've tried to pare it down a little bit, but you know, as with uh, many things at the UN, there's a lot of uh, verbiage that goes along with understanding uh, these processes. So if you just uh, give me one moment, I'll try to run through 
um, these slides to give you a better idea of what the HLPF is and what are some advocacy points uh, at, the, at uh, this particular mechanism. Following that, we'll be uh, speaking with uh, several uh, Indigenous community leaders, uh, Sarah Yawanawa, Yves Minani, and uh, my very, uh, another dear friend and colleague, Tai Pellissier, or Tai Pelli. And so uh, let me just uh, share my screen and we'll get right into this. All right, so for those who, uh, by now you should all uh, be aware, uh, you saw this little uh, round kind of rainbow symbol in Nina's presentation. Uh, and you'll see this all over uh, the UN and in even some national uh, campaigns. This is talking about this UN Sustainable Development Goals. They say there are 17 goals to transform the world. And this uh, started in 2015 when the UN agreed uh, to these 17 uh, SDGs or uh, Sustainable Development Goals and uh, with the aim to mobilize efforts to end uh, poverty, inequalities, tackle climate change, uh, all the while ensuring, and this is the tagline, uh, that no one is left behind. So uh, just to not go over each one of these uh, individually, but this is the 17 uh, global goals. Uh, you'll be able to find this information online, or if you participate in the course, we have information that you can download uh, on uh, this issue specifically, so you'll be able to get much, uh, many more resources. But you'll see it talks about poverty, hunger, and probably one of the most important for indigenous peoples is uh, reduced inequalities. But uh, to let you know, uh, indigenous peoples are referred to at least six times. Uh, in the SDGs, uh, there's the goal two on zero hunger, and also uh, there's the, on four on the target 4.5 on education. And in addition, there's also uh, associated targets that are also uh, important to uh, indigenous peoples, such as you know human rights principles and standards that are reflected in what we call the 2030 agenda. And uh, overall, uh, the agenda is really focused on reducing inequalities. That means that's where the whole leaving no one behind comes in. And, uh, you know, as indigenous peoples, we have to be really um, vigilant when we think about these SDGs, because what are they really talking about? They're talking about access to resources. And uh, where do you find uh, uh, much of the world's resources left today? The biodiversity, uh, et cetera on the territories of indigenous peoples. So it's something that uh, we should monitor uh, as much as we can. So uh, I'll go to the next slide. And this one is about the HLPF itself. And so this is the main uh, space for dialogue on sustainable development. It has the central role in the follow-up and review of the SDGs. And the forum meets annually under the auspices of what's called the Economic and Social Council and uh, at times also under the General Assembly. So here's a lot of words on this one, uh, but basically this is talking about uh, what was discussed during this uh, uh, HLPF. They wanted to specifically focus on uh, goal one, which is no poverty, goal two, zero hunger, and they always talk about uh, the integration of all of these goals as well. Statements, uh, when uh, they were able to be presented, were about two minutes. Some were recorded, some were line, uh, live, some were posted online, and you had to be registered to speak. Down here, uh, it, at the bottom of this slide, it shows that 44 countries presented or were scheduled to present, and we have some of the names here. And uh, you can look online and follow up to, to find out where their reports are. And those reports are called voluntary national reviews. And that's important because uh, the Secretary General uh, with voluntary national reviews set up some guidelines so that all of these are, are clear and compatible. And that uh, it's important to note that these voluntary national reviews or VNRs in English are state-led, meaning that the countries themselves, state governments, so when I say state, 
uh, that we're talking about countries, right? So uh, those are the member states of, of the UN who are participating in, in these initiatives. So uh, these reports are member-led. Uh, and they aim to offer a countrywide view of the progress of their uh, movement towards the SDG goals, right, at the national and subnational levels. So the reviews that they uh, present cover all the SDGs uh, that fit uh, within their national circumstances. And here's the important part for indigenous peoples. The national processes should include relevant partners and stakeholders, and that, of course, means indigenous peoples. So civil society engagement in the process is highlighted uh, and civil society can play uh, uh, a role here uh, in the 2030 uh, agenda in developing policies, implementing programs, monitoring delivery, and advocating for improvement at all levels. And that includes the global, which is the United Nations level, uh, the regional, where you work with other regional organizations, for example, uh, Asia regional initiatives, Latin America and the Caribbean regional initiatives, and national, meaning uh, follow up at the country level. So this is important for your advocacy as indigenous peoples or local communities moving forward. So the stakeholder engagement is what uh, is accomplished through what they call the major group and other stakeholder processes. And this dates back to 1992 at the Rio Earth Summit. And uh, following that, in 2012 at Rio Plus 20, they widened the stakeholder participation. And I'm going to uh, show you that. But the last uh, point here is that these major groups are self-organized through the major groups, uh, HLPF coordination mechanism and steering committee. So when you want to follow up, that's the in, uh, engagement mechanism that you want to hit. So here are the uh, major groups. There's nine major groups. And as you see, indigenous peoples are one of those nine major groups. And the other stakeholders that I uh, spoke about uh, just, just in the previous slide also include uh, these other groups. And I see you also see that I've highlighted local communities. Why I did that is because in some places where indigenous peoples are not recognized, they might also be uh, recognized. Uh, people might be recognized as local communities. The two terms are not um, are not the same. However, uh, we find them linked together more and more uh, in global processes like the SDGs or the um, the Convention on, on uh, Biodiversity or the Climate Change uh, follow up on the Convention of the UNFCCC. So for indigenous peoples, it's important to note that there is an indigenous peoples major group. Simply Google that, Indigenous Peoples Major Group on Sustainable Development Goals, and that will would, should take you to the website. Right now, the two co-conveners of the Indigenous Peoples Major Group are Joan Carling of, uh, and Janine Yazi. So you'll be able to connect with them and follow up uh, directly. And that, that's the, really the main way to get involved if you really want to get involved. Follow up with the Indigenous Major Group because you know, these processes are not an individual exercise. You have to go through that main uh, major group process and participate there. This is just an example of a regional mechanism. You might have others depending on what uh, part of the globe you're from. This is uh, one that, that happened in Asia. Uh, the next one is a, is a case study from Kenya, uh, just showing uh, how the uh, national engagement uh, went through the Ministry of Devolution and Planning. Uh, Kenya set up an SDGs roadmap, and you could see that uh, in there they have a SDG forum. There's at least at that time there was a hundred organizations engaged into uh, in, with an interagency committee. That's a governmental committee, and they developed their own civil society report, and that's available also online. So this is just a, an idea of what can happen at the national level. The question is: Is thing, something like this happening in your country? So here's uh, just some advocacy at the global level, some of the ways that uh, you can uh, participate. One, monitor the agreements, organize briefing uh, for governments on concerns of the citizenry. And, you know, I just want to say there, when we use the term civil society and indigenous peoples, you'll see often that uh, I, I did it here, but I also separated because civil society it means that you're, uh, you know, under the authority of the state government. However, with indigenous peoples, it's important to remember that uh, 
many indigenous peoples have their own forms of government. So we're not exactly civil society or many indigenous peoples are against that term and just want to be identified uh, as indigenous peoples uh, within the system. And there's talk about that now. But here, circulating information in and outside the UN, advocating for positions at the national level, and underscoring links between national actions and international commitments. And we hope that the course helps do that. And also highlighting the action of NGOs around the world and drawing attention uh, of the media to the key issues. All of these things are important. There are many challenges. I, I, I don't need to go into a lot of them. If you want to have a copy of this, we can get that up. Or you, you can watch this again as uh, this uh, program will be recorded and you'll be able to see some of these slides. But you, you get an idea. There's always challenges when you work with the UN system. Here's uh, additional tips for advocacy. Uh, there's national and regional global links. Uh, make those as much as possible. Lobby governments at all three levels with the same message. That's important. Uh, and, you know, depending on where you are, that could be uh, more difficult. So here's uh, another thing that can help you. Identify key member states which champion your interests. And this works better uh, at the regional or global level where you can meet with other countries that may help elevate your particular issue and even uh, maybe help you with some uh, engagement with, with your own national government. Develop briefings on your issues, analyze and respond to the VNRs, those are the country reviews, and also collaborate with other indigenous peoples, organizations, and, and SCOs. That's what I have here. That means civil society organizations that share your agenda. That's really important because that's the way that you'll get your message to the national level, engaging with others, that networking. And Tribal Link is big on that. So here's some additional tips. Sign up for accreditation with the Indigenous Peoples Major Group. Work together with partners on side events like we did today. And enable diverse voices from your own organization to be heard. And engage with the IPMG uh, or the Indigenous Peoples Major Group to ensure uh, access to the latest information. And there's a number of websites and things that, that you can get involved with. But again, in the course, if you take the course, there's a, there's a specific um, section on sustainable development, and it comes with a booklet that you can download. And many of these links are there. And uh, that's where I'm going to end, because I want to get right into our, uh, our speakers for today. And uh, we can definitely share uh, much of that information uh, to the participants. Uh, and, I, and I have a, another uh, one that might be even more useful, but let's get right into our discussion. We have three uh, excellent uh, presenters today. Uh, what I'd like to do for this portion is really uh, engage in a bit of a dialogue. I know that last bit went on a, a little bit, but um, you know, uh, we have with us today Sari Yawanawa, who is uh, from the Yawanawa peoples of uh, Brazil. We have uh, Tai Peli, who is uh, Boriken Taino, uh, indigenous peoples of the Caribbean region, and also uh, Yves Manani from Burundi. So we want to engage them now in a little bit of talk. One, uh, I, I want to begin uh, first with thanking you. I'm going to put your uh, bios into the chat because we want to give you more time to speak. But uh, maybe we can all start with Ty. Uh, you know, we started this program talking about project access. And I'll go to each one of the panelists for this. How was your experience with project access, Ty? And, you know, why do you think a program like this is important for engagement at the HLPF or uh, whatever mechanism the, the uh, Indigenous peoples choose to go into? And thank you for the invitation. Um, the, the, the work was intense when I, I had a, a, an in-person type training at, when I first went as a participant. And I really noticed the effect and the difference that Project Access uh, and a program like this, as Mukaro is saying, um, had when I was on the floor, when when it stopped being dress rehearsal and it became the real thing, I understood that there was a significant difference from the interventions pre and, and, and the understanding 
of the interventions by indigenous peoples that had not received the training. I also saw the frustration that people had because a lot of people, uh, a lot of times, many communities send their advocate to the United Nations, you know, with great sacrifice, thinking that that um, human rights defender, that that advocate is going to come back with solutions to their community. So there was not an understanding of the mandate and the purpose of gathering there, for example, at the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. So we found a lot of our, our of, of us helping other, other indigenous um, human rights offenders that were there to advocate, to understand and even help them with their own interventions. And so that is like really powerful. And that had me understand the importance of, of this type of training. I am super proud that at this time, um, we are having this online and to see my relatives here, uh, uh, Eves and Sarah, it's, it's, it's a great honor because many years ago, this was only a dream. And, and we were always thinking of which ways to, to reach out to more and more indigenous peoples. And I think that this wholesome way that has been created in collaboration with Tribal Link, uh, um, Learning for Nature, UNDP, and all the others that have contributed is of the essence when it comes to advocacy at the different mechanisms and for the different um, conventions that we have to follow through with. The, the links that we make between the mechanisms and the declarations and, and instruments that we have at the international level are key to what we do at the community level. So to me, it is, it is, it is magnificent. It is something that shall continue to grow and be promoted. And I truly hope that all these agencies, the private sector, civil society, um, and, and really governments from the local and forward, um, take a look at this program and, and become part of the learning process as Nina showed us, those, those that wanted to learn about um, and engage more with indigenous peoples. We must promote that. And I think it's of the essence. Pahom. Home. Thank you, Ty. Uh, always good to hear you. I want to go to Sarah. Sarah, you've also you were also a Project Access alumni. Uh, how did you feel about your participation, and what ways do you think that this is important uh, for Indigenous peoples? Do you think it's worth it? Thank you, Roberto. Thank you. I'm so great. I'm, I need to speak for you. Oh, obrigado, Roberto. Thank you, Roberto. And I'm sorry for me. It is a great honor to be able to participate in this event today. I feel extremely happy to have participated in 2019 in the Access Pro Project in which I represented my community. Tai said, Tai was able to pinpoint precisely what the difficulties were and I fully agree with each and every topic that Ty has highlighted. We come from our community with serious and big problems. And with the support from the Access Program, I, I felt welcomed. And I understood that the history of the indigenous people at the United Nations, I was able to feel safe. I was able not to feel alone and by participating with other indigenous leaderships in the world, I was able to understand that we share similar dilemmas. At the same time, this has strengthened us. I felt stronger, I felt welcomed. In the workshop, I, I was able to see that it was something really important and highly informative to give us the forum so that we could understand the history of indigenous peoples and to write a chart is not easy. 
without the, the project support, I would not have been able, I would not have been able to present my document at the right time, at the right place. All the support is incredibly important for our mission here. I believe that each and every one of us has a mission in here. We can feel this power, and not only with our community, but in others as well. Roberto. Thank you so much, Sara. And uh, we're happy mm -hmm. that you could be here with us. Um, right now, I want to go to Eves. Eves, also your Project Access alumni. Um, how did you feel the course uh, affected you? And do you feel that this is useful for other Indigenous peoples to engage in a training like Project Access or other uh, training opportunities if they feel like they want to engage at the global level? Merci beaucoup de, de m'accorder la parole. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak. I agree with my colleagues. Truly, this program is very important. It was so interesting, especially for us, we Indigenous people. Personally, um, I did the program in 2015, like Sarah, and it really prepared me for making presentations, for writing a good presentation in front of the permanent forum. And also I learned how to summarize reports. During the training, I also learned about how to send reports to the UN, how to get them to read them. For example, there's the mechanism for protecting the rights of indigenous people. And this program is critical. Before, the, before, the program was only offered in two languages, English and Spanish. But today, we French speakers are very happy and proud to be able to participate in this program as well. It's a great thing. It's great for us. Sometimes we understand a bit of English, but I'm not uh, as comfortable as when I speak in French. So it's a great opportunity to have this program available in French as well. I would also say that it would be great to have the program in other languages as well, so that more indigenous people could enjoy it, could, could uh, benefit from it, this training, which was so useful. Thank you very much for uh, allowing me to speak. Thank you so much, Eves. Let's go back to Ty. Uh, Ty, you know, uh, part of this program today, um, we spoke about the high-level political forum and the sustainable uh, development agenda. You know, what does sustainable development mean to you as a Taino person? And how can you give us an example of how the community um, embodies that or manifests that or promotes that in any way? Let me... Gracias por esa eh, pregunta, Mucaro. Thank you for that question. I consider that, well, few people know that in las metas anteriores, las metas del milenio, the previous no habían sido SDGs, indigenous peoples have not had not been considered for this agenda that actually is supposed to cover what's going to happen in the next. 15 years so the fight of our uh, people and particularly you are one of the persons who cooperated uh, in order to mention indigenous peoples this was a huge fight but we had good results because as you said in your introduction in your and in your presentation we have been mentioned many times so it's important to understand that when there are a global objectives 
for the next 15 years, it's not only important for them to include us, but it's also important for us to bring this to our own communities and start working on that and train others and educate others. Because unfortunately, at least with my indigenous peoples, with my indigenous people, the information, we're not getting that information. So in breaking, we don't receive this information from the government. The United States has not done any effort in order to bring this information to its territories. However, our people is uh, going through a lot without having any type of information or knowing that there are certain liabilities. So as indigenous peoples, we need to promote this as advocates of our rights. We should also bring this information since we cannot uh, rely on the government to do so. So this type of meetings and including indigenous people's voice in this process, such as this high level forum is essential in order to make progress and have more of our rights recognized. That's how I see it. So each one of us know that we have, there are 17 SDGs as indigenous peoples, we are always affected first before any other member of society. Thank you so much, uh, Ty, for that, Hahom. I wanna go to Sarah, the same question. You know, what does sustainable development mean to the Yawanawa people? Thank you, Roberto. So sustainability, I see it as a model, a new model that we have uh, to coexist with the nature. For us, Yawanawa, there is nothing new there because we always lived in harmony with the nature, preserving and respecting the environment. A model of sustainability that we, Yawanawa, have been working with and are strengthening is that we're working with agroforest and we're planting trees around the forest uh, the empowerment of women is a very important topic in our community because uh, we women have taken on a role that's ever more important within decisions that are made within our, our communities so i believe this is fundamental really not only for our community yawanawa but other communities as well and education I consider that to be essential uh, education, especially for our women and our children. I consider education the path to knowledge and with knowledge, we are able to know what our rights are and protect our rights and be informed and know and speak for ourselves. I think that there is nothing better than we ourselves speaking for ourselves. We have a voice for that and I think it's very important this uh, congruence of, of, of all the voices uh, and strengthening the voices ever more. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's go right to Eve. Same question, sustainability for the people in Burundi and, and you know, maybe even, uh, you know, beyond, uh, because I know you come into contact with, with many other communities. Uh, same question to you, Eves. Thank you very much. In terms of the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, in Burundi, the Batwa indigenous people have made some progress, especially in terms of building up their resiliency to climate change and against the discrimination that we face in terms of agriculture and education. We also, um, I can tell you some examples of better um, increased in equality in Burundi. Today, in our country, in my country, we've made significant progress. 
because in our National Assembly, we now have representatives and senators and also people working in the government in the various ministries who come from our community. And in terms of fighting against discrimination, I can tell you that the indigenous people where I'm from um, often face discrimination, but it, things have been getting better. In terms of equality, things have gotten much better. And in terms of food and agriculture, I will give you the example of how in Burundi, it's sometimes hard to meet your needs just from farming. And people sometimes don't eat enough meals every day. 80% of households can only eat one meal a day. And that's a problem uh, that comes from the fact that there's not so much arable land. And uh, there are not services that are available for us. So that's kind of what I have to say about uh, the government. Our government has tried to make the SDGs part of our own national laws, because we know that including the SDGs uh, between 2018 and 2027 is very important, but that we will have to work on aligning various ministerial efforts on the uh, SDGs. And often, indigenous peoples are not included in the national plans that the government comes up with. We are often not included in the national policies that are developed. So that's what I have to say to answer your question. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of you. Um, now, Eves, you did mention in your pres in your response now that um, Burundi has tried to engage uh, the local communities and indigenous peoples in their national reviews. Tai, uh, when she responded earlier, uh, made uh, the response that it's it's not the case uh, at least with the Taino uh, community and uh, others and other insular communities uh, you know there has not been outreach Sara what what about Brazil has there been outreach uh, from the government about the SDG agenda that has made it down uh, to the Yawanawa people that you know of No, no, no. The Brazilian government has not had any direct or even indirect dialogue with us, Yawanawas. Uh, much the other way, it has been what has happened in Brazil is a situation that is very sad for us indigenous people. The Brazilian government uh, has been marked uh, of by a massacre to the rights of the indigenous people. So uh, I don't see any any attempts of dialogue or conversations or anything close to that for us to be strengthened by this current government. They have been uh, very aggressive. We have lost rights that we have built for years. We have lost rights that were uh, major battles and all of that has been destroyed through this government. And I don't feel that this government represents us or is uh, on our side at all. Thank you, Roberto. Thank you. Challenging, challenging times for many indigenous peoples, which is why it's important to have space uh, like these side events so that uh, when governments do present uh, their versions of uh, what they feel as uh, completing the SDGs, maybe some of them are not even submitting their, their national uh, voluntary reviews, but in indigenous peoples need to be able to share uh, their perspectives as well and really talk about uh, what is happening on the ground, especially if the theme of the day is to build back better after COVID is to tackle climate change, is to achieve a sustainable development agenda. Uh, we need to hear these voices. And as Ty said, it's not just, um, you know, giving us that seat at the table. It's also that implementation uh, 
uh, and making sure that that uh, implementation happens at the very grassroots. So um, I know we're we're, we're uh, coming. We we still have some time. I I, I see for for uh, opening up for for some questions uh, from uh, the audiences. Uh, yes. So why don't we do that? Uh, why don't we just take a break uh, just for one moment? If you have any questions for the panelists, um, Sara, Ty, or Eves, if or if you have a question for Nina uh, and UNDP, uh, please type it into the chat, and we'll see if we can address it here. I know someone typed a question into the Q&A uh, section. We, we've tried to answer most of those, I think. Uh, but um, if you have additional questions based on what you've heard so far, it could be uh, you know addressed specifically to one of the speakers, or um, it could be uh, you know about the course itself. And we have our, our our dear friends from UNDP, our colleagues here, who might be able to to help on specific uh, questions. So here's a question from uh, Miss Silva. Uh, she's also from Acre. Uh, works in a socio-environmental NGO. She completed the course in uh, or completed the course in uh, April and May, and thought it was fantastic. Um, learned a lot. Super happy to know that it's reached young indigenous leaders of the Amazon, such as Sa Sarah Yawanawa. And this movement needs to grow more in Brazil. And now with the Portuguese version of the course, it will be much easier for the, uh, and I don't know uh, uh, how to pronounce that one, Tahi, uh, Tai, uh, or uh, who are great Brazilian leaders to access this content and follow the paths to strengthen the voices of indigenous peoples at the UN. And it's, it's an essential course to strengthen the resistance and guarantee the rights of indigenous people in this Brazilian context of increasing governmental threats. And that's just what uh, you were sharing, Sara, uh, now. And uh, very important, you know, uh, not all of our peoples are connected to, to the internet. So it's important that if you have this access, really inform others about it, raise their uh, raise the visibility of the course. And, and again, this is a self-paced course. And you'll really be able to open the doors for more people and more voices to participate at the UN uh, level. Uh, here's a, a question for uh, Shirley Thompson. Uh, do you see the Human Rights Declaration uh, as having enforcement that the UNDRIP does not? Does anybody have the... Um, I, would, I, would, I would say I'm taking a... You know, make an assumption here that we're talking about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and um, does that have enforcement where UNDRIP does not? Does anybody want to uh, take this this particular question on, Ty? Uh, excuse my, eh, disculpen lo lenta que me pongo en la computadora, así es lo que cambio el lenguaje de nuevo. I'm sorry, it takes me a while to change channels. In regards to that question, it comes to my mind, what we need to understand is that we have these UN human rights declaration for indigenous peoples, but this human rights declaration was not an instrument. In, there was legally binding in the UN. However, people started using that instrument until nowadays, pretty much every government talks about that human rights declaration and they cannot publicly say Oh, I'm against this human rights declaration, of course, because it's a universal human rights declaration. Therefore, once again, it is essential for us as indigenous peoples to be the ones who actually, actually make this human rights declaration valuable for indigenous peoples. We need to use this 
at every single point in time at a local level, at a national level, at an, at an international level. We should always link all our issues, complaints, problems that we face to one of the human rights that is included within this declaration, because that declaration is also inspired when you read introduction, uh, it's inspired in other international instruments that are, most of them at least, uh, legally binding. And we are the ones who need to actually fight for this declaration. So we are undergoing a process and we need to start this initiative because the states are not doing this. The governments are not doing this. And I guarantee you, this document lasted pretty much, it lasted, it took like 30 years to for this declaration to be adopted by the uh, General Assembly. And I can assure you that today, this declaration wouldn't be approved if we hadn't fought for it. So there hasn't been the intention to implement it. Most countries haven't had that intention. Therefore, we need to be empowered and educate others on the power of this declaration. As indigenous peoples, we have specific rights as people who are different from different cultures, and we cannot allow that what's included in that declaration in regards to indigenous people's rights go below or behind what's included in those articles. So each one of us needs to do what we did in the past with that universal declaration uh, for human rights. So they started using it and that's why today, nowadays we see that it's quite powerful around the world. That, that's what we should do as well with our own document, with our own declaration. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ty. Uh, for that response. Uh, do any of the other panelists want to add anything uh, to what Ty has, has just shared? All right, I, I could just say that as, um, you know, moderator and uh, someone who has worked with, with all of these folks, you know, I just want to emphasize uh, along with Ty is that we're the ones who, who give this these documents the strength, right? We're the ones who who make sure that uh, we remind uh, states of uh, these commitments. And this is not an easy job uh, for indigenous peoples. And, uh, you know, some folks see now where there are major uh, conferences that lead to these agreements like the SDGs or the climate change agreement. They see indigenous peoples going there and, you know, this participation, this level of participation, of visibility, this this ability to access governments and and uh, you know advocate for for our positions. It, as Ty mentioned, it has not always been that way. It took over, as she said, thirty years for the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples to be adopted. And during that time, there was a lot of hard fought battles, and actually, we lost many people over the years. Uh, uh, from various circumstances. And, you know, that continues today where we see that, you know, although we've achieved the high level with the declaration, uh, there's also backlash that comes with that. You know, it's, you can almost compare it to when uh, Barack Obama was elected president of the U.S. At one level, you know, an African-American, uh, you know, represented achieving that office of the presidency, uh, represented a certain level that 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 the nation had come, but then you saw uh, not too long after the backlash from that and the rise in in oppression and racism that came uh, in response, and and I've seen that on the ground with the declaration, where we now know these the we have these rights, but yet there's a backlash from folks, and this is why you know we have to continuously uh, be um, advocating at every level we can, and it's not easy. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay, there is also a question. Well, there's uh, registration assistance uh, being asked. 
one and okay I don't know if there's a, another question here uh, Modibo there was a question was that uh, something that can be shared does somebody want to read that because I, I don't know where the question is Roberto there are questions in the Q&A section okay some of those uh, questions have have been answered uh, but was there one that was not answered? I, I see a, a specific name here, and so I'm just trying to, to see yeah. where the... So, uh, how about the one from Juan Pablo Torico? Oh, where... okay, great. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to read it out, uh, Nina? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, Juan thanks us. He says, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and hello to you, Juan Pablo, as well. Does the course include information on dialogue of knowledge this is a very important issue that has been discussed since the IPBS, uh, which is the, the biodiversity panel, the, interna the international the panel on biodiversity and ecosystems meeting in Panama, but it seems that little progress has been made. I'm not sure what he's referring to, um, but Roberto, if you have knowledge of the dialogue of knowledge, yeah, I'll just say that, you know, the course itself is uh, according uh, to our talks uh, with the with the collaboration uh, is an ongoing uh, process. So, you know, we have certain focus on certain mechanisms uh, in this iteration. And, you know, as we move forward, we might see the need to also add uh, information on others. It's it's not it, it certainly. Uh, might need to uh, cover others like I, uh, like the IPBS, and uh, so we don't have that information now. But I do think that you know these these talks are, are interlinked, and that getting involved in the processes and and bringing that up and showing the linkages between these different mechanisms is another important part of the global advocacy. So I see another uh, question here now that I see where the questions actually are. Um, let's see. Uh, some uh, Chief Dwayne Perry of the Lenape Nation, the Ramapo Lenape, thank you for being here, uh, Chief Perry. Uh, here's a question for the panelists. Do you see any potential for development of a united indigenous global economy? And if so, what do you see as the next step in the develop in developing a collective global economy. So, does anybody want to take a a, a shot at uh, responding to this question? Do you see any potential for a united indigenous global economy? Ty. Una de las cosas que, que seguimos conversando y que, y que lamentablemente en estos instantes eh, COVID ha detenido ha sido precisamente eh, que una de las ventajas que tenemos cuando estamos cara a cara en este tipo de entrenamientos es eh, el poder, Ty, we're not, el poder we're realizar redes. We're not the, the translation yeah. in English. Yes. We're not getting the translation in English, and, and you're making some important points. Are you on the Spanish channel? Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So we're not hearing the translation uh, in English. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, but I was on the Spanish channel. Was there a problem there? I you couldn't hear what you were saying. Uh, Juan or Marianne, could one of you, um, which one was planning on doing the uh, interpretation here? Okay, perhaps, uh, you know, we could try again, go back to the Spanish channel and, and, and see if we can get that translation going. If not, you know, maybe we might have to re revert. I don't know what's going on uh, with the translation, but we'll try to find out right away. E intento de nuevo. Can you hear me well now? Okay, so one of the things that's always an advantage is that whenever we are face to face 
in the United Nations, we have the opportunity to connect with around 2,000 colleagues who do our same job in their own countries. And we can do some networking and then that goes beyond the training that we get. It goes beyond what we do within the UN system. To answer to the question, well, in these conversations, there's always uh, commerce. I mean, there's always trade. We promote this system amongst ourselves. COVID has stopped us momentarily, but that's just a goal. If eventually you can have this indigenous global economic system, then, well, I I don't lose hope, but we have to start promoting this from our own spaces with the indigenous peoples we know. For example, okay, what do Lascala, our Lascala sisters can ha have that can help our brothers and sisters from the Caribbean? And we can do these type of exchanges and trade with whatever we produce, uh, handicrafts and anything that we produce so we can create an indigenous market where we make our own opportunities grow with our indigenous brothers and sisters. So I do believe that we can do this, but it's on us. We have to keep connecting with our brothers and sisters from other indigenous peoples. So what else can we do? talking about ecotourism as well, maybe training in order to have other natural uh, methods so like pesticides in our system and so on and so forth. So that uh, knowledge exchange and exchanging our products can grow, but that needs the initiative of each one of the indigenous peoples in order to connect with others. That's why the alliance, that's why our ancestors uh, had alliances and th that is extremely important. We are going through difficult times. We are having Zoom meetings. So in the meantime, with these mechanisms that we have available to communicate amongst ourselves, we can also start fostering or promoting our indigenous uh, trade. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ty. Uh, I don't know, perhaps Sarah or, or Eves, if you want to uh, mention anything about this. I know the Yawanawa have engaged uh, with some large corporations with, with trade. And is this possible? Uh, do you feel that if we can do indigenous to indigenous trade as well? If you want to take the floor, Sarah, you're welcome. For sure, Roberto. As Ty has said, I believe it's really important to have a connection between the communities among the people. And I believe the information is of utmost importance. We have been working in our communities, strengthening our practices, our traditional practices, that is, uh, such as arts and crafts. And we we feel really pumped about talking uh, about using our jewelry and our clothing this is the first moment of pride that i feel to have this moment of richness being able to share with other communities as well as the information i totally agree with ty we are capable of working with our own resources thank you thank you eves is there a possibility for trade uh, eves, será que há alguma possibilidade de comércio uh, in uh, burundi no burundi I hear the, the, the Portuguese translation yes. on the English channel. Okay, Yves, go ahead. Okay, merci. Yes, thank you. I wanted to add that 
between different communities in Burundi, there is some trade, but not only amongst indigenous people, but also with other countries around us. Many of them are very poor. And so the Batwa in Burundi um, traditionally lived in the forest, but many of their products are not valued because people have modern materials, imported goods, which come from outside of the country. And in the past, you could sell traditional products and earn money that way. But today, with modern technology, it is much more difficult to engage in this kind of trade um, with our traditional pottery, for example. But um, even trade amongst the Batwa remains. And while we are trying to come to terms with interacting with other groups and trading with them, the, the situation remains as I have described. Goods from the outside and modern goods have replaced many of the traditional goods we used to sell. Thank you. Thank you so much. There's still a few questions and comments uh, coming in uh, to the chat, but I want to say that uh, I feel a thank you to all the panelists for uh, addressing Chief Perry's question about indigenous economies and uh, establishing a, a globally indigenous economy. I think that that's something that uh, could be the source of another uh, webinar or, or discussion, uh, an ongoing uh, discussion actually, to see how that can be built up. Because as we know that indigenous peoples are, are not just, uh, we don't all have the same situations uh, as uh, these panelists have uh, demonstrated through their uh, responses. And it would be really good uh, to find and see the level of, of, uh, of uh, capability amongst uh, and in between the in indigenous peoples. So I want to just uh, scroll very quickly. I saw that there was uh, uh, Juan Pablo uh, spoke about an Aymara word, and I, I would never do it any justice by trying to pronounce it. Uh, so I would just say that it highlights the importance of dialogue and your work, and he's, he mentions here, your work is very important so that we can continue talking. And, and very, thank you very much, uh, Juan Pablo, uh, for making that comment. And that's what this is about, really engaging, uh, sharing ideas, and hopefully inspiring us to do more and, and so that we can achieve something better for our communities, which is really what the SDGs uh, in some, some part is about, reducing inequalities, uh, dealing with uh, these issues of uh, impoverishment, you know, poverty is the word that they use, and we often describe, uh, you know, just just be out of habit, describe our peoples as poor in some instances. But you know, when you really look at where indigenous peoples are and the resources uh, that we manage, you know, we're really very rich, uh, but we become impoverished by the oppressive systems around us. So I just wanted to make sure that that was uh, clear because there was another question here uh, from Shirley Thompson that spoke about the Indian Act in Canada, which puts all First Nations land in trust with the Crown being the trustee. So the Crown is the, uh, is, is the um, body there, uh, the, that governance uh, body, I guess. And then is this a situation in other countries? What approaches uh, to land back are being taken elsewhere? If, if you don't know what that means, that there's a, a campaign that's going on now that talks, says land back, right? And this is about returning land to indigenous peoples so that we can uh, strengthen our communities, economies, our, our, our right to self-determination, uh, and so on. So, uh, you know, are there any initiatives? I mean, with the Yawa Nawa, you, you, you already are in control of, of massive hectares of, of land, uh, you know, but uh, do you, are there still problems uh, with, uh, I think you mentioned some, same thing in, in Burundi, uh, is, is this a situation with the Batwa? Uh, are you trying to get land back or do you control a, a certain amount of territory? And I know this would be different in the Caribbean as well. So why don't we start with Sara? We'll go to Eves and then and then Ty, and we'll wrap up this round of, of questions.
Obrigada, Roberto. Oi. Thank you, Roberto. Right now in our indigenous lands of the Yawanawa, we have been suffering threats of fires, which have ha been happening in other places in Brazil. Because we're in the deep forest, we're not totally protected, and we're exposed to these dangers that have been happening. Our, our lands have been marked. These are the first indigenous lands in the state of Acre in Brazil. Uh, this is a very important advancement. Uh, we're not free from threats. We are, each and every time we suffer more and more threats due to this current situation and our land is not totally protected. We're constantly organizing, protecting, fighting against daily challenges. This is a daily challenge. It's, it's education that's needed in our communities. It's awareness, it's environmental awareness. I do not believe that we are fully protected as other communities in Brazil. We also face a lot of problems in our territories. Thank you, Sara. We'll go to Eves and then Ty, and we'll have to uh, make these responses uh, a little bit more concise because we are uh, running down to the end of our time today. Uh, Eves, go ahead. Okay, merci de m'accorder la parole encore. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak once again. In terms of land, where I'm from, it is a major problem in our community. The majority of the Batwa in Burundi live from making pottery, but they don't have their own land to harvest clay to make this pottery. In the past, we also lived from hunting and from gathering, but they took all the forests away from us and made them into natural reserves. So today, in terms of land, in terms of where we can find clay to continue with our livelihoods, it's very difficult. We are trying to advocate with the government so that we can go and harvest clay or cultivate crops because almost 90% of the Burundians live from agriculture. So we would like to as well. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ty. Well, regarding territory, the main uh, threat that they are facing that there has been in this part of the world, in this hemisphere, well, we are an indigenous people that lost many of our land. And on top of that, the, the threat uh, continues. We've been twice uh, colonized, um, both through invasions. So what I would say is that there is a huge focus on land protection. Even for the second global conference, of uh, indigenous women. This is one of the uh, topics that that were uh, the most discussed and were, was presented as a, as a huge challenge. What I could say is that the fight for our rights, remember that the rights uh, are not taken from us. They are violated. So this is a very important issue our sister uh, Sarah already uh, talked about the threats, even though for that people that already had land uh, were threatened. And this is this also happens in the, the US. 
In the US, the indigenous peoples that have land are under a trust, the same way that in Canada. And there's uh, a lot of obstacles for that, but I would like to let you know that indigenous peoples, even though if we uh, lose our lands, we do not stop fighting for them. So we have 523 years of fighting, and I know this is a huge challenge, but I would encourage everybody to fight for their rights and to not normalize the violation of our rights. We shouldn't let that pass and say, well, this is what happens to everybody. We shouldn't normalize that behavior. We need to fight for our rights and let people know what's going on. Thank you so much, Ty. Uh, I think that's uh, an excellent place to end uh, this portion of our conversation. And uh, we have just a few minutes left, so I, I just want to take the opportunity to thank uh, Ty Pelly, Sari Awanawa, Yves Minani for uh, their excellent insights and their participation uh, in our side event today uh, that was hosted uh, by the Tribal Link Foundation and the United Nations Development Program, Learning for Nature, Equator Initiative. Uh, we want to thank uh, Julie uh, f and uh, Victoria for all the behind the scenes, the technical and uh, getting thing everything ready. I also want to thank uh, and really send a big hug to Nina uh, Concheva for always being such an excellent uh, partner for Tribal Link and Indigenous Peoples and also for sharing those uh, beautiful words about our former uh, founding um, founder and executive director, Pamela Kraft, who just uh, passed away recently. We thank you for, for those words uh, about our dear Pamela. And uh, we're certainly looking forward to continuing our collaboration into the future. I want to thank all of you who tuned in, uh, who asked questions. I'm sorry if we didn't get to all the questions. There were some questions that were presented that I felt that in the dialogue, uh, we did answer them in, in some ways, especially the one about indigenous peoples and access to the internet. We know that that's not for everyone. And uh, we urge folks to try to, who do have access, to try to make sure that others who don't get this type of information, uh, others who don't have access can get this type of information. I wanna be clear uh, in, in what I'm saying there. Um, I also wanna thank all the translators who have uh, really done a great job uh, in helping uh, to make sure that we have this wide um, participation. Uh, thank you very much um, to anybody else that I didn't mention over from the tribal link side and the wanting and also helps us uh, get a lot of this information out. And, uh, you know, on behalf of myself, uh, Roberto Mucaro Borrero, it's been a real pleasure to help facilitate uh, this panel today. And I really hope that uh, you can visit uh, the tribal link foundation website. I did add the link in the chat. Uh, you might all know that uh, if you go to the bottom right, you'll see three little dots and you can actually save the chat, uh, or at least uh, some of us might be able to um, save that chat if you want to go back on any of the information, but you can find Tribal Link Foundation online. And also please uh, visit the uh, Learning for Nature platform. Besides the Project Access Online course, the Indigenous Peoples at the United Nations, there's a wealth of information that you can access and other courses that you can be a part of. And all of this can contribute to the sustainable development and the climate change agenda. So it all really works in. We try not to silo our work. We wanna make sure that it can uh, cross pollinate and fertilize across um, mechanisms and systems and, and, and that we can uh, continue to support uh, indigenous peoples and, and, uh, and allies along that way. Really, it's about an empowerment and, and equity at the end of the day. So that's where I want to end. I don't know if Nina or anyone from UNDP wants to say anything, but I, I'll say, thank you sisters and brothers for being here with us. And uh, Nina, I don't know if you want to say anything before we go. Just want to thank everyone for being here. Thank you so much, Roberto, for always leading us um, with uh, a very steady 
hand in mind and Ty, Sara, Eve for being here, the UNDP team, um, traveling friends and board and um, let us know how we can continue to help make sure that these events take place and these discussions and dialogues take place. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. Home. Merci, bye. Merci, placebo. Thank you.